Good afternoon. Welcome to State of Play, another Manhattan Institute e-event. Today, it is our honor and privilege to be with Richard Ravitch for a discussion about the state budget, about Governor Cuomo, about the MTA, and about the mayoral race and New York City policies. Good afternoon, Dick. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Welcome. Dick Ravitch is one of New York's most prominent, if not the most prominent, public policy and public sector management figures of the past five decades. Dick served as MTA chairman between 1979 and 1983, during which time he convinced the state legislature to enact the MTA's first dedicated taxes to rebuild its capital assets. Before that, he served as chairman of the Urban Development Corp in the 1970s. Most recently, he served as lieutenant governor under Governor David A. Patterson after the resignation of Elliot Spitzer. He's a longtime affordable housing developer in New York City. Among his projects are Manhattan Plaza, the artist housing west of Times Square, which helped rebuild the area in the 1970s. He's also the author of the 2014 memoir, So Much to Do, a terrific read. I highly recommend it for people interested in learning more about New York City. Uh, good afternoon, Dick. Thank, thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. Nice to be with you, Nicole. Likewise. Uh, Dick, last week you had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal titled, New York is in Trouble. And in the op-ed, you wrote that today is a different story in a worse way uh, relative to the 1970s situation. Why is, is today uh, worse than what the city went through in the 1970s? First of all, there's no similarity at all. What happened in the 1970s was simply that the city of New York borrowed money to cover its operating expenses because prior to the enactment of the Max statute, which I'll explain in a minute, uh, in the late spring of 75, the city was not required to budget in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. And when the mayor of New York City went to Governor Rockefeller and asked for more aid to New York City, Rockefeller said, no, I have no money to give you, but I'm going to make it easier for you to borrow. So we changed the municipal finance law to enable the city to borrow the amount of money on an annual basis equal to what the mayor estimated his forthcoming revenue would be. Well, the mayor's estimates were a wish list and they borrowed close to $7 billion over the next few years. Uh, and John Lindsay was happy to solve his deficit problems that way. But after the UDC collapsed in January of 1975, the banks came to Governor Carey on May 2nd and said they would no longer underwrite the notes and bonds of the city of New York. So New York had to pay off close to $7 billion in debt. Um, <clears throat> which um, <clears throat> required some creative refinancing of the existing debt uh, plus uh, federal aid. And uh, finally, even after the president had initially rejected uh, the governor's request for federal aid, produced the famous headline, Ford to New York Drop Dead, um, nonetheless, he changed his mind in the business community, uh, including bank presidents and airline presidents, insurance company presidents, all went to Washington and uh, um, pummeled the Republican administration uh, about help for New York. And finally, actually, a month later in November of 75, I was in the Treasury Department working out the details of a $3 billion line of credit. Um, which the federal government made available. But New York City was not, I mean, there was a general national recession in 75, but that was not the major problem. The major problem was that all this overhanging, inappropriately incurred debt. And that's not the problem now. The problem now is we've had hundreds of thousands of people move out. We've had people learn that they can conduct their business or their lives uh, um, now in, in ways that weren't technically available to them uh, in years past. So their dependency on physical proximity was diminished significantly. 
Uh, there were enormous health problems, to say the least, um, and enormous unemployment problems, more acutely felt in New York City than almost anywhere else in the country. Uh, and the proximity of, of attractive suburbs um, and uh, with the tax structure as it was, was already a disincentive for people who had choices uh, to live in New York um, because already 5% of the uh, population were paying 60% of all the taxes in New York State. Uh, but then this year, the legislature, uh, unwisely in my judgment, decided to increase the tax burdens that the very rich would uh, pay. And it was an inappropriate and stupid time to do that because for New York's recovery, uh, which we can talk about in a minute, uh, we need capital, we need rich people, as well as a lot of other things uh, to ensure that New York's revival occurs within a reasonable period of time. Now, you, you just uh, referred to the state legislature and the governor's tax hike. We're looking at a 24% tax hike on the state's top earners, who are also the city's top earners. And, and you said that this was an unwise idea. You also referenced the hundreds of thousands of people who have left the city. What do you say to the people, specifically Ginia Belafonte, columnist at the New York Times, a couple of other prominent pundits who have said, well, we don't have to worry about that. The rich will never leave New York City. They'll never move down to Florida permanently. New York just has too many cultural amenities, too many good private schools. You know, this is all just fear mongering. Well, uh, only time will tell. Um, <clears throat> I hope I was wrong and they were right. I really do. I've lived in New York my entire 87 years and I will never move myself. I love this city and I'm tied to it emotionally, physically, in every which way. And I have children and grandchildren who live here and uh, step-grandchildren and I wouldn't leave them for anything in the world. But let me tell you something, Nicole. Very simply, cities are the greatest socializing institution that exists in this society. And New York City will come back. I don't know whether it's going to take two years or 10 years. Um, when, when we had the vast immigration of very poor blacks and Puerto Ricans in the late 60s, in early 70s, most of my contemporaries at that time were moving to the suburbs. They'd get married and they moved to buy a house in Scarsdale or in, uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut or Long Island. Um, uh, and if I told you what the price of co ops on Fifth Avenue was then and what it was last year, you would be shocked by the difference. But New York came back because people wanted to be in this socializing context, uh, as well as all the cultural uh, uh, in inducements that exist here. Uh, the opera, the movies, the concerts, the sports, uh, the basketball, the hockey, the, the baseball. But above all, the restaurants and the bars. That's where young people met other young people. Um, and um, it's gonna come back. But it's, it's gonna come back a hell of a lot more slowly if the tax differential between New York and every other place grows as much as it's grown this year. That is a clear disincentive. So I don't know whether everybody who moved to Palm Beach is going to move back. Um, I, the response I had to my Wall Street Journal piece, where I got two emails from people I know who moved to Florida <laughs> saying, Dick, sorry, there are no more homes for sale in Palm Beach. You're out of luck. Uh, I emailed back saying, I have no intention of moving to Florida. It's a culturally a desolate place to live. 
um, and they don't have any good opera or any good sports teams. Uh, and they have a dreadful right-wing legislature that's trying to prevent blacks from voting. So I would have no interest whatsoever in moving here. Um, good and, for you. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> but kidding aside, um, uh, I think that uh, there, are, there are a lot of public needs. And I certainly understand why people in politics want to respond uh, by creating more governmental efforts to help people. But there is theoretically no limit to the needs uh, of a society, uh, particularly an urban society that has a lot of poor people who are dependent on public services. Um, but there also has to be an awareness that you need, <clears throat> you need to have people who have capital to invest or economically productive um, living in a, the city as well. Um, and it's a delicate balance to strike. Uh, I do not understand why New York is distinguished from all other jurisdictions in this country by imposing such a relatively higher tax burden. I mean, we've tolerated it for a long time because of the greatness of the, the excitement of New York City. But I think at this point in time, they really rubbed everybody's nose in it by trying to extract more money from the same people. Yes, and I want to remind people, please put your questions in the chat. We already have two good questions, which we'll get to in a few minutes. And uh, speaking of the tax increases, the governor is politically weak right now. Do his uh, personal behavioral problems over the past few months do you believe that that impacted his ability to negotiate with the state legislature? And can Governor Cuomo remain in office and be an effective governor over the next year and a half? Well, <clears throat> let me say this. Uh, Andrew was a bright young man. Uh, and <clears throat> I don't know what his prospects are of uh, surviving the investigation by the attorney general or the inquiry being made by the state assembly. But in my opinion, he will survive both. Uh, whether he runs again, I have the vaguest idea. But clearly he doesn't have the same clout that he had before. Uh, and therefore couldn't and didn't exercise the leverage in the budget negotiations that he would otherwise have I think leverage as he has in the past to protect the public from uh, legislative excessiveness. Do you think that the governor should have vetoed these tax increases and dared the legislature to try to override the vetoes, just like Governor Pataki did in uh, 2001, 2002? I don't know the details of what transpired, but yes, I wish he had, um, obviously. Okay. And let's talk about the MTA. I think it's safe to say that uh, you care a great deal about the MTA. You were responsible in the early 1980s for getting the resources to rebuild the MTA after uh, ne decades of neglect. MTA has received $16.5 billion in emergency federal aid. Their problem for the short term is not money but ridership is still very low. Ridership is between 25% of normal on commuter rail and 35% of normal on the subways. What's your outlook for the MTA in terms of getting their ridership back? And can today's MTA leadership learn lessons from your own experience in the 1980s? Well, again, I don't think they're analogous. Um, I think if we don't get riders back uh, another few years, the, the generous money from the federal government will carry the MTA for a couple more years. But after that, if ridership is anywhere near as low a percentage of what it was uh, before the COVID, um, uh, the MTA is not gonna be able to, to cover its expenses, let alone 
maintain the physical plant in an appropriate fashion. So it will be a, the most serious crisis that the city and the state will face will be the public transportation crisis if people stop using them. And I again, that's all tied into the question of how quickly the city is going to recover. Uh, and to recover, we need, amongst other things, people who say, I'm moving back here, I'm investing here, I'm going to build things, I'm going to do things, I'm going to give money to uh, institutions that generate activity and public uh, participation. <laughs> Excuse me. Yep. And it, it also means bringing office workers back. According to the partnership, only 10% of office workers have come back to Manhattan. These are people who are obviously uh, not taking commuter rail into subways right now. What is your outlook for repopulating the uh, Midtown Manhattan office district? Well, as I said before, I think young people, uh, you know, I eat lunch generally at a restaurant. I got to know the owner uh, before COVID. The, <laughs> excuse me. The restaurant's closed down. But I talked to the owner occasionally. And he said, if you think it was crowded at lunchtime, you should have come at cocktail hour, Dick. The place was filled with young people who come to meet one another. And they have drinks and they have hors d'oeuvres and they have dinner. Uh, and they all work in the Midtown area. Um, so that's what I meant by saying New York City is the greatest socializing institution in the world. Where else could you come to meet uh, other young people uh, and meet a cross-section, the kind of cross-section we have? So if you're interested in meeting people of one ethnicity or another, where else can you go and and have the opportunity to meet anybody you wanted to meet. Um, and I, I think that's the key. And I think it'll come back. I just don't know how quickly. Do you think that the investors in, in Manhattan office buildings are going to see a long-term decline in the value <laughs> of their properties? I mean, right now, a lot of buildings are in forbearance the lenders are not moving to foreclose uh quickly because they don't want the they don't want responsibility for the properties right now will that change over the next couple of years will we see a big resetting of of prices downward uh i think you will uh unfortunately uh but i also think that um that um what hasn't been discussed very much is that every property owner, if you have a restaurant or a store or tenants um, that aren't paying rent, you're going to seek a reduction in your assessed value. So the property tax laws that the city will realize over these next few years are going to be far more than they're currently projecting. Yeah, and they're already projecting a significant uh, decline. I mean, a 15% decline in uh, uh, commercial property taxes was baked into this year's budget. So, uh, yes, that, that will be a significant challenge for the next mayor. And as before, I don't know a property owner, Nicole, who isn't going to seek a reduction yeah. in the best value of their property. And uh, before we get into your thoughts on the, the mayoral race, Let's take a few questions from the audience. We have a question from John Faso. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Mr. Faso. Why is the, the New York City business community so passive in the face of the radical agendas of city and state politicians representing New York City? And of course, you can question the prem uh, premise of the question if you think they're passive or not. Well, I don't think they've been passive. I think Kathy Wild, uh, as head of the uh, New York City Partnership, uh, which is the only institutional representation of the business community, has been extremely outspoken on this subject. Um, and tried, she's tried, I talk to her often, she tries to be as effective as she possibly can. I think what, what 
you have another problem here which is contributing to this chaos. And that is you don't have a New York City newspaper of any significance anymore. You know, I, I would like to point out that in 1975, you know, probably the most powerful people in New York were Mike O'Neill, the editor of the Daily News, and Max Frankel, who were editor, who was the editor of the New York Times. And their words carried more weight than anyone else. And they were totally publicly spirited, bright as hell, uh, and never disagreed on any fundamental issue that the city faced. And no politician could afford to take the risk of contradicting these newspapers, which had circulations uh, totaling millions of people. Well, it doesn't exist anymore. New York Times is no longer a New York City newspaper. Uh, and the other newspapers don't have the gravitas or the circulation that enables them to be a major force in, in politics. So uh, I don't know how else uh, the business community can make itself heard. Uh, a lot of people may, tried to make themselves heard by moving down to Florida. Uh, uh, but um, nobody wanted to boast about it. Uh, uh, I hope that's responsive, Nicole. Yeah, in the in the fragmentation of the media, I mean, back uh, when you referred to the editor of the Daily News, the, the New York Times, I mean, the Daily News had a circulation of a million daily readers, and now... Two million, and, two million. Two million, and, and everyone now is reading their own little Twitter feed. They only read the news that they, they want to see. I mean, I would I would venture to say... Many people in New York City, if they don't live in a dangerous neighborhood, are not even aware of how much crime has risen over the past year. And so on that note, we have another uh, audience question. What about the role of public safety and the quality of public education as factors in whether people stay or leave New York City? And this question is from Michael Dardia. Um. Well, let me say this. I think that because of the tragedies that have occurred, uh, there's an understandable sensitivity about the way the law enforcement system handles uh, people with dark skin colors. Uh, and I don't think the law enforcement world has been as sensitive to that subject as they should have been. And consequently, they're getting beaten up rhetorically uh, and politically. But we need effective police force. We have to attract bright young people into wanting to be, become members of a uh, law, law enforcement system. We can't lose sight of that. We can't get rid of we can't defund the police. We can't get rid of a police department and expect the citizens to maintain law and order uh, adequately. So I think that's a problem that will, re, that will solve itself over the course of a few years uh, once these tragedies are absorbed and, and the people who have misbehaved are treated appropriately as they should be uh, for what they did. Um, but um, I think that uh, as far as education is concerned, uh, we've always had uh, a damn good public education system in New York, and we always will. Uh, and. I think the fact that people who can afford it uh, may send their kids to private school doesn't say anything that's different about this uh, society that we live in. Um, and I think, therefore, that uh, there's no dramatic change that has to happen in the, in the school system. Okay. And we have a question from Jeffrey Moskin. 
How can the city reduce the cost of building subway tunnels and expanding public transit? I have the vaguest idea how you reduce cost. Um, it depends what you have to pay for concrete and steel and wood. Those are things that are not controlled by New York. Um, so I, uh, I don't know. We okay. always managed to adjust our public economy to the uh, realities of the marketplace to the extent that we're dependent upon buying products or services in the open market. Yep. And on to the, the mayoral race. The, uh, the Democratic primary is uh, barely more than two months away. Uh, I know that you have spoken favorably of Ray McGuire in the New York Times. Why do you like Ray McGuire over his many rivals? And uh, are you, uh, since we're having rank choice voting, who would be your second and third choice? Well, I happen to like Ray McGuire and admire him. And, and think well of his motivation to give up uh, a very successful career and a wonderful lifestyle with a beautiful wife and wonderful children and to put himself under the uh, spotlight as he has um, because he cares and he thought it would be a very useful thing to do with his life at this point. And I admire that. Uh, very much. Um, obviously, he has no experience or uh, background with the city, uh, but neither did Mike Bloomberg. Uh, and, they, and neither did Ed Koch. Um, when Ed Koch first ran for mayor in 1977, everybody laughed at him. The, the, the newspapers supported Mario Cuomo in the beginning in that primary. Um, but Ed Koch turned out to be a pretty damn good mayor. Made tough decisions um, uh, during the period of fiscal stress in the city uh, and ended up being universally respected as a, as a mayor of, of integrity and, and ability. Um, and uh, <clears throat> look, I think there are, I think that Sean is a, uh, I've known Sean since he was a youngster. He's a very able guy. I, uh, I think equally well of him. He is, uh, would be a superb mayor as well. Uh, I, I, I know the others. I don't know Yang, I've never met Yang. Uh, I have nothing against him. I, I worry a little bit about a guy who's just done nothing but run for office for the last three years. Um, and who hasn't lived in the city and hasn't been part of it. So he, um, on the other hand, if he gets elected, I'd be glad to help him in any way I possibly could. Um, Scott Stringer and Eric are, are both able people. Um, and um, I think uh, Maya Wiley and uh, some of the others are not very realistic about what resources they will have uh, available and New York City is going to face a horrendous fiscal situation when it spends the money that they're getting from the federal government over the next two years, which will keep them alive for that period of time. But then the um, it's going to be tough as hell, and the city is going to have to cut uh, its workforce very significantly. Hmm. Any thoughts on Catherine Garcia, the former sanitation uh, commissioner? She no, I don't under. know her. Uh, her father used to work for me. Her father yep. was a very able guy and a wonderful human being. Uh, I don't know Catherine. In, in, uh, speaking of the fiscal situation that the next mayor will face, do you think that the city should freeze wages? And if so, uh, should the city do that before the, the federal uh, aid runs out? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I believe in labor unions. Um, and I believe that whoever gets elected in this crazy system that we've created with ranked choice voting uh, 
ought to sit down well before they take office with the major unions to represent the municipal employees and talk through what has to be done to meet the, um, the revenue expectations as long as they're realistic. Uh, everybody, <clears throat> generally, nobody likes to, to deal with um, austerity, but the next mayor is going to have to deal with austerity in a very serious way. And they're not talking about it in this campaign. And it's not a way that one gets elected by talking about how you're going to cut. Uh, so I think we're not going to learn until there's a result from the June primary. And then we'll evaluate whether or not the person who prevails in that horse race um, is willing to be intellectually honest and then secondarily effective in uh, coming up with a plan that has uh, that is realistic about the city's potential resources. In in the speaking of the uh, tough choices that the next mayor will have to to make and things that he or she certainly does not want to talk about in the campaign. We have a question from Cliff. Any ideas about New York City's unfunded pension obligations? As you know, the city's pension funds are only about 70% funded. The uniform pension's even uh, worse funded, and the city is spending uh, $11 billion a year on pensions now. Um, to be honest with you, I've lost track of those numbers. Uh, I used to know them well, and uh, I think the uh, city has got to fund its pension systematically. Yeah. I don't think it should be increasing benefits through labor negotiations, however, at this point in time, uh, nor should they change the time in which people become eligible to receive pensions. Uh, both those things should not be expanded at this point, given the city's austerity. Um, but to whatever extent the city is bound by its contractual undertakings uh, to make benefit payments, they better do it. Yep. And uh, we're, we're just about out of time. I want to thank you again for taking some time to speak with us this afternoon. And of course, I think it's safe to say any current politician or aspiring politician, you have always uh, been generous with your time and making yourself available and giving uh, advice if people just want to call you up and, and talk to you and, and get this invaluable advice. But just in your in your closing remarks, if you would, just tell us what what kind of advice would you give to a mayoral candidate or a gubernatorial candidate who was calling you up today? Well, I would... Uh, uh, that, that may be one of them now. It is, as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, but I would tell you very honestly, um, I don't give advice about how to get elected. Uh, I ran once. I got 3% of the vote. Uh, I had the most distinguished list of New Yorkers you could possibly imagine who supported me. Uh, but I think the question you should ask, Nicole, is what advice would I give to the person who is going to come out on top and okay. is going to be mayor. And my advice would be to understand the numbers first and foremost. Second of all, to reach out uh, and make sure that you understood all of the potential talent that was willing to commit to a few years of public service. And I grab that talent. Um, and I tried to build uh, a plan during the six months between June and the time you took office that was re fiscally realistic, uh, uh, et cetera. 
Well, thank you, Dick. And again, uh, we greatly appreciate your time this afternoon. We are sure that both the next governor and the next mayor will benefit from your insight. And thank you to our audience for uh, watching this uh, Manhattan Institute State of Play event. If you've enjoyed this event, please consider donating. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nicole. Pleasure to be with you. Likewise. See you soon, I hope.